Hello, Lucas. Can you hear me? Hey. Yeah, I'm good. I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yeah. We, have, we actually have a great connection, even though we like... Yeah, like it's actually quite wake. rainy today, so... Right. A little rainy, so I, I've been worried about the connection. <laughs> well, the first... Quite, well, I mean, I just introduced you briefly, and I, I said that we've met in... Uh, I think we've met in Eating Bartender first time, but then mm. um, it was the whole men and shawl things when I was posting oh, yeah. the guy in shawl <laughs> and you were one of them, this beautiful shawl that you needed. Um, I wanted to start this um, Philippines actually. So I checked the weather there and the average low is like in the 20s of centigrade. So how did you like when the first I know you started very early, like as a kid, but like, do people need, do people wear knitted stuff? Like, is there a market for that? Okay. Um, yeah, actually, yes, that's correct. The, the average temperature, low temperatures are like in the 20s, but that's in the lowlands. I live in the highlands of the northern Philippines in the Cordillera mountain region. Okay. And it's a very, it's, it's, a, it's quite different weather here. In the Philippines, they call my city the, the summer capital of the Philippines. So that's where so people go actually, for the summer to cooler climate. Yes, because in the summer, in the summer, summer evenings, like we have now, we can go as low as 15 or 16 degrees Celsius. So that's quite... And it, does it, it get could be like quite cold chilly. in the winter? Um, we don't have winter. We only have like dry and cold season. Right. Uh, dry and wet, wet season. Yeah. Like the rain yeah, season. but um, during January and February, in my city, we can go as low as 8 degrees Celsius. Okay, so you so can wear pretty... some. Yeah. yeah, that's why I'm wearing one now, because it's quite <laughs> chilly today. <laughs> can, can you get lift up just for a second so we can see what you're wearing? Sure. Oh, that's pretty. This is the Cotton Grass Sweater by Petit Knit. One of my favorites. Right, so let's go back, back, back. So you like this little kid, right? Who taught you? How, you started crocheting first? Yes. So did, who, um, who taught you? My, my mom actually taught me how to crochet and knit as well. Uh, around the same time, around seven or eight. Okay. And for a while, I exclusively did crochet. In elementary school and all throughout high school, I, was always, I always had a project like maybe a hat or a purse, a crocheted purse. I have one, like maybe one knitted project, like tucked away. I didn't like knitting in the beginning. What, like what, was what about crochet made it speak to you more? Because it was quick. Okay. <laughs> I could basically finish a hat in an hour. Right. It's, that's how quick crochet was. And I was able to sell Tell like some of my some of my hats in elementary school to teachers to students, and so give me it gave me a little bit more allowance. Right. <laughs> Give me Tell money. Me about so, your first, yeah, do you remember your funny. first sale? Your first customer? Who was that? My first customer was my teacher. Actually, she bought a she bought a hat, and yeah, that I couldn't even remember because that was way back in what third grade maybe. So do I couldn't even like, remember did the Did you approach anymore. her or did she said, oh my God, it's so beautiful. I'd like to buy it. How did that work? Do you remember? No, because I, I used to crochet in school. And so I, I brought that. my projects in. She didn't mind that. I mean, I did it in recess and eventually I had hats and then, oh, maybe I could buy one. And she bought one. And eventually students were asking to make me purses and hats. And, and that's how I started selling those. To my classmates and to my teachers. <laughs> right. So, um, what was like a project that you remember like back from that time that you were most proud of? Like was there something that you challenged yourself and or was it all simple same kind of thing? Um, during maybe like during the late 90s and like early 2000s it was very uh, um, they call them Jamaican hats. So like Rasta hats, right. which has like a very wide, like it's a wide circle. System. And then, yeah, it's like a barrier, but it's really quite wide and dramatic. And those were quite a challenge because they, they went quite big, quite huge. And then you decrease them. And then if the decreases wasn't right, it was going to curl up and, and whatever. So 
those those kinds of hats I was very proud of making and, you, and in crochet too. So like let's colors. Say, <laughs> let's say like if you need something, right, or crochet whatever something and you're getting stuck, were you going back to mom? Was she helping you out? Like or she just taught you the basics and then the rest you figured out by yourself somehow? Um, she taught me the basics and I figured out, uh, I figured the rest out. Um, they were, I was a frequent visitor to li these thrift shops that sells books and I could, I, I would usually go and find a knitting and crochet magazine that would like have these all uh, like a stitch, stitch instructions. And that's how I learned like how to decrease in crochet, front post and back post and yeah, that's, that's how I learned. <laughs> right. And then when did you start knitting more seriously? Um, I started knitting more seriously, like, in very recently, like in 2019. Oh, really? I just, out of the blue, because I really didn't like knitting, because it was slow, and it was small, and it took really, really a long time to progress. Like, I couldn't, like, two inches in crochet is like nothing, no time. Right. But two inches in knitting would take you like a few hours at least. Right. <laughs> so that was, I mean, that was what I hated knitting. about knitting. Yeah. But um, I've always liked sweaters. I've always worn a lot of sweaters. And in 2019, around August, I decided to learn how to knit a sweater. So I had to look for like circular needles. I, I knew circular needles uh, existed before, but I've always just used the straight needles. And I think that was one of the reasons why I hated knitting <laughs> right. because the needles weren't really circular. So I, I looked for circular knitting needles and I, I looked, I went to the market to buy some yarn and decided to search YouTube how to like, how to make sweaters, like seamless sweaters. So what and was your first, first sweater? The first sweater I did, I just played with it. I, I wish I brought it. I didn't bring it. The very first sweater that I've, that I made, but it was a raglan, it was a raglan sweater. Right. Um, I had to measure, I had to measure gauge and I had to compute like how, how much, how much, how many stitches I need to cast on and how, how the raglan steps was, was supposed to do, uh, to, to happen, to increase on, on the shoulder and on the body. And that's how I did it. Actually, but, I want to ask you something. So when I was interviewing, um, um, Hazel Tindall, uh, oh. a friend of mine asked, uh, is there like a way to customize the sweater? Because majority of sweaters are designed for women. Like there's much more designs yeah. for women out there than for men. And he was like, luckily I'm very skinny. So it's usually not that big of a deal, but like, how do you customize it? And when I asked her, she was basically like, oh, it's just too much trouble. I just make the same shape for men and women and somehow the wool will stretch in the right places. Do you <laughs> have your bag of tricks? Like how do you, you customize? I mean, you, you making designs for yourself and for the guys. So like, do you find them different from the sweaters that's created for women there? Um, yes, I've actually, well, like last year when I started designing, and I really want to design sweaters. I haven't really released any sweater patterns yet. But um, with sweaters, a lot of it are, is, are for, for women. And I've found that women's sizes tend to be a little tighter on men because it's like half sizes right. is, what, is what happens. So what I do to customize it for my body is to increase like the, the, the cast on, on the underarm. That's where I, I, I add stitches to accommodate my body. And it's a more boxy type for men. It's easier to knit a men's garment than a woman's garment because of okay. it's less shaping right. <laughs> unless you want to taper it. It's, it's usually just a box or like a tapered. But yeah, um, that's the only thing I, that's one of the main things I do. And another thing is the necklines are usually very, very wide for women. Right. So what, uh, the, the thing I do with that is I, I start off uh, after the collar and I pick up the ribbing after uh, when I finish the entire sweater and reduce around 12 to 24 stitches. And that usually does the trick. Right. Um, 
talk a little bit about your Fair Isle technique because I'm like honestly blown away by that. I was actually like watching the videos that you posted and Neater's gonna need. I like watch yeah. them on repeat for like few minutes just to get like how you hold the needles <laughs> and how like because you're so efficient is it like I just recently started Fair Isle and I do it fine like I mean my tension is getting better like I'm more in control of it but it's like such a turtle pace in comparison to like your hands flying so how did you learn how did you come up with that technique I see um It's funny because um, I, I play the piano as well. And I relate like finger, finger movement and mobility to, to my playing, my playing as well as to my knitting. They're, they're related in some way. So in my mind, when I was working with a, for a technique, I was looking for a technique for stranded collar work. I wanted to establish like a muscle memory that I could use. Right. Whether so, I tried holding it, holding two yarns in one hand, and then I found that tedious with the floats because my floats were getting twisted, and so I decided to hold it on both hands, and that worked out very well because number one, I was a I was a crocheter first, so it was it wasn't a problem with with knitting continental. Right. So I practiced doing English style. It was tediously slow. And yeah, what, but what they say with music, as a music teacher as well, slow practice develops muscle memory. So I just wanted, I just did a swatch, a very long garter stitch swatch of me knitting in English style. Right. And the problem with that as well is, this is where I discovered that I knitted differently because my stitches are mounted the Eastern way. Right. So that means that I knit through the back loop. And the way I, the way I get my knit knit stitches is I pick, uh, instead of picking them I wrap my knit stitches mm -hmm. so the way western mounted the way uh, the way you typically knit is you pick your knits right and then you wrap your pearls but I do the opposite way <laughs> right so yeah so I discovered it I discovered that so when I knit English style instead of a yarn going under the needle I have to lay it on top of the needle right So that, that's how I practiced my, that's how I practiced English style. And then eventually I, I knitted a swatch that is like, it's like a one by one rib, but in color work. <laughs> so instead of doing a pearl, I knitted like one from the continental and then one English. And then right. one. I just did that. And okay, then I have eventually... to ask you one quick question. So, um, And I ask the same question. I mean, I'm repeating myself with you and Hazel Tindall, which I think it's great, you know, honor energy. Yeah. <laughs> um, but do you have anything against flat fair aisle? Do you like escape it by every mean possible? Or is it like you don't care if it's flat or if it's in the round? Um, I don't really mind purling in fair aisle. It's a little slower. So if I could if I could get away with it, I'd, I'd, I'll knit it in the round. But if it were if it was absolutely necessary to knit in uh, to purl in fair isle, I I have no problem with it. I would it really love depends it on the if pattern. you personally would shoot a short video of you purling in fair isle, just because like I when I did the flat fair isle, I didn't mind. I mean, the knitting side was fine, obviously, but like the pearl side, I I couldn't figure out how not to tangle my yarn. It was like every stitch it was twisting. So, and I, because I need the same way that you need on the front, right? When I knit in the round, mm. I use the needle, I hold the needles and like use the yarn the same way. I would be like super curious if you could shoot the pearl side. As a that's, so, that's so true because I'm, I'm sure because of the knitting style I do, Purling is actually easy. It's very easy because I have to go when when I purl, I, I have to I have to put, go under the needle this time. So oh, it's easier to go under. Like little little like one minute tutorial. I would love that. <laughs> I will. I will. I will for you. <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk a little bit about your music uh, background. So when when did you start? What did you start with? I know that you graduated into being a conductor but like what did you how did it start for you okay um 
So I've always loved singing. And the first time I've sung in a choir, I, I'm a choral singer by heart. I mean, my heart is very close to choral singing. Um, the first time I've sung in a choir was when I was six years old. So all throughout elementary school and high school. In high school, I went to an arts, uh, to an arts program um, and I sang all throughout my, my, my schooling years. So that's how it started for me. Um, in the beginning, I, we really didn't afford like piano lessons. And so I, I had to learn piano by myself up until high school. The only, the first time I've, I had a formal piano lesson was in college, okay. but the facility was there. It was, was good. I surprisingly was very quick with sight reading. So that was no problem. <laughs> so yeah, um, it started very, very young. I started singing then and piano. I started learning maybe in the beginning of high school. And by the time I was in college, I, I majored in composition composition and then eventually I shifted to choral conducting okay and now I relocated back here and I, I conduct a community choir and I hold lessons I seldom perform nowadays but I miss it so much <laughs> yeah it must have been like especially difficult for for you as a musician to deal with the uh, quarantine and you know COVID and all that stuff yeah tell me a little bit like how did is uh, is knitting and crocheting is it like a social as so as, like when you met the knitting bartender right the, all this group and it's like super social there's like zoom sessions meet and greet all these drinks and what have you and all the guys um is is there the same social culture in philippines like do you have people that you get together maybe before covid or like during covid is there anything like that there Yes, um, the knitting community in Baguio is not very big. There's not a lot of knitters here, not, not like it used to be. Um, but um, I've found in my city, there's five of us and we call ourselves the Knitting Super Friends. <laughs> we do have an IG page. And so they're, they're all women, they're, but really I love them so much. I miss them so much. We haven't knitted in, in a hot minute because of the pandemic. Right. So that's, um, we used to meet at least like once a week to have just the coffee and the catch up and, and just to knit. And it was really fun. Um, the bigger community in, in, in my city, at least, is the crochet community. There's a lot of crocheters. Right. A lot of them make a living by crocheting. And so I haven't really connected to, to any of them. Like personally, we did like a couple of, Zoom calls with them, and I'd like to meet them in the future. Are there any, now, I, any types mm. of uh, like yarn festivals in Philippines? No. no, unfortunately not. There's a lot of craft festivals, like recently, like in where people sell their here. crafts. Yes, so there's in my city at least there's Mando Kokito, which means sell your let's sell. It it just means let's sell. It's initiated by the city government. And it's, it's an artisan market like held every now and then. Right. And people, people sell their woven stuff there and their baskets and a lot of, a lot of carving, wood carving and small, small craft items. And that's really, that's been really fun. Right. Do you still sell your things? Yeah. No, no, unfortunately not. So now you only sell the patterns? Yes. On the finish up. Okay, so let's talk about your first design. Like, was there somebody who told you, Lucas, listen, you've been doing this for a while. Why won't you try your hand at designing? Or did you wake up one morning and you were like, you know what? I'm becoming a designer. Like, how did that happen? Um, it happened when I, it's a funny story because when the quarantine started, um, all of these Zoom calls started, and one of uh, one of the one of the Zoom calls I attended regularly was um, from the Men Who Knit group, it was hosted by Joe Wilcox, and they they basically like encouraged me to maybe you can write down these designs and whatever. At first, I was really not, I don't really want to, but <laughs> because it, it it seems like a lot of work, and it really is. I mean. Right. The amount you pay for 
well written designs are not worth it. It's 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 really way below <laughs> what it's worth. Right. The work is really, but yeah. So I started really designing with their encouragement um, when when the pandemic started, and I started with a very simple stitch sampler shawl, just to get my head around like measuring the length of yarn and the gauge right. and writing instructions. And yeah, I approached, I approached writing patterns the way I did my own musical compositions was to start, start, with, start somewhere, start with playing with yarn and then figuring out how to structure a, cert, a set of instructions for it. And so it's the same approach as I approach my composition. Right. Um, when you first published your design, what was the reaction of the knitting community to that design? Was it like easy for you to market it? Were there any difficulties like to establish the fan base? How is it compared to your second design? Like how do you, like if somebody thinks about getting into design, like tell us about your beginning. Like was it a rough beginning, easy beginning? Um, it's, I'd say it wasn't really, it's not a rough beginning. I wouldn't say that. I'd say it's a slow beginning. Right. Um, I published like a free, a free shawl pattern. My, wait, I think I have it. Let me see. I think I do have it. It's this one. Yeah. <laughs> it's, just, it's, it's a very, very simple shawl. That's a stitch sampler one. Right. So it's just a garter and a seed stitch and then with a couple rows of eyelets asymmetrical shawl and yeah um my main problem with that was i really couldn't get good photography for it photography so if you're thinking of a, of being like an independent designer make sure you brush up on photography i mean it's very very it's a very hard it's a very hard market because people are very visual nowadays you have right. to catch them with a visual uh, with with the visualization of your design and yeah that's what where I struggled on the second design was my first paid pattern was a cowl actually this one the Danau cowl and yeah the struggle there was looking for testers actually right <laughs> looking for testers for willing testers especially when you're starting out it's, it, it's very difficult to find testers, but once you find your testers and you get good feedback, the feedback is what's important actually than the, right. than the number of testers or, yeah, even if you have a very, a very, uh, a few, a few testers, as long as the feedback is good, I think that the design will survive. Right. Do you, but, yeah. do you market mostly through Instagram, through Facebook groups? Like what's your marketing strategy? My strategy is to just post. I mean, on Instagram, lots of hashtags <laughs> right. and share to a, lot, to a lot of groups, but some groups really don't allow like self-promotion. So that's a bummer. Right. So I'm starting to, to shy away from, from those made, uh, big, um, big groups and look for, look for groups that allow promotion. Right. And, yeah, I'm hoping it's there's going to be like more of those, you know, because people get fed up with all the negativity and the big meeting. That's groups. true. <laughs> yeah. So I've, I've, left like, I've left a few because of that. Right. I, I left one huge one, actually, because I was trying to post. So Monique Boonstra came up with her new show and I was the test meter for it. And then she used my picture for the cover of the pattern. And she oh advertised God. it for the like Monday promo, whatever Friday promo that the you know all these groups yeah, have. Yeah, yeah. And then I tried to post my picture, so it was that picture plus few more like very detailed pictures of my knitting, right? And I wasn't trying. To, I mean, obviously, like if she would sell a few more patterns from it, it would be great, right? But that wasn't my point. I was basically just bragging about the fact that I managed to knit that show, right? That's true. And they refused my post so i wrote to administrator and i oh said gosh. i don't understand like i didn't put the link to the pattern i just put the name like why wouldn't you allow me to post the show and she said 
we've had enough of your promoting. What? <laughs> and I was like, well, self-promoting. And I was like, well, this is like by definition false because I don't sell anything. So I can't promote mm -hmm. myself, you know? And it's like, why on earth would you like, even if I was promoting somebody else, like, why would you be against it? Like, we're just all trying to help each other grow, you know? It's like, why is That's it very true. negative, you know? Um, how do you find time, like, between your, because I'm sure, like, your music career takes a lot of time and effort. How do you find time to need to design? Like, how do you split your time? Oh, my gosh. That's the question I've been trying to solve like for these past months now that everything's trying to get back to normal and like I have events and I have students and it's, I still don't know. <laughs> I try to knit every spare time I can get in between students when I'm not doing anything, when I'm not doing music, when I'm at home, I don't do anything. I just sit down and rest because I need it. Right. But when I'm in my office, this is basically my workspace. I teach music here. I knit here. And so every, when I'm not doing anything is when I knit. And that should change because I want to structure it a little bit so that I have time because I have a few, I have a lot of patterns. I challenged myself this year to put out 21 designs. Oh my God. <laughs> because, it's, because it's 2021. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know if I can finish it. But whether or not I can finish it, I would want to structure my time a little bit between my music and my knitting because knitting has been very, it's a lifesaver actually during the pandemic. Right. During the pandemic, during lockdown, I didn't have any, there wasn't a source of income for me. All of my music was gone. Right. There wasn't really anything. So knitting was something that saved my sanity, the community, the Zoom calls was very helpful. Like being creative right. is, is one, of, one of the biggest things that I love about knitting. The fact that you can play with a string and essentially make a garment out of it is still pretty amazing to me. Right, it's pretty crazy. <laughs> um, did any of your students ever ask you to teach them how to knit? Your music students? A, a few. <laughs> <laughs> a few of them. I haven't really managed to teach them yet, but... Yeah, with um, me and my friends, my 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 knitting group here in in Baguio, we organize. We sometimes organize like um, classes, like basic knitting classes, right. and that's been productive. But then the the pandemic, like, put a stop to that. So maybe when everything is a little bit normal, we can return to it. Right. Tell me a little bit about your yarn stash. Do you have a yarn stash? How do you buy yarn? Where do you buy yarn? What kind of yarn do you buy? It's very embarrassing because I have a very big yarn stash. I have like around 60 to 80 kilos of yarn. Oh. Like, <laughs> so. Danielle it's Shard, if you listening to this, my yarn stash <laughs> is small by the comparison and I feel like I have more yarn. <laughs> Yeah, but um, the, thing, the thing about being in the Philippines is it's very difficult to get wool and good wool. So I've, uh, I've had to ship my, they're, they're local sellers, but they sell a lot of acrylic and a lot of cotton. They've been really, they've been quite good. Okay, I have a confession to make. Sure. This. We won't tell. Whatever goes on on Instagram stays this on This shawl, my, my, my latest shawl, the Chico River Wrap. Um, this is a color work shawl and then it's steeped but this is cotton okay i mean they um like cotton actually it's like it drapes it doesn't, almost like a wool yeah it doesn't it doesn't really look like cotton but it is cotton and cotton they say you don't really steep cotton right but i don't really care <laughs> as long as, Nobody as, long as I, people forgot yeah, to send long, you a memo that you don't steep cotton <laughs> yeah i've been i've been reading about steeping and yeah, I, I steep cotton, so no big deal. Anyway, um, cotton and acrylic is like a lot, a lot of them is what they sell, a lot of those is what they sell here with online, with the online shops and the physical shops and the, the local shops. Um, so I get my wool usually from Turkey. Okay. A lot of them, I, I ship it from Turkey. Um, and also last year when I was beginning my design, um, Jody Long was very kind and he... He sent me some yarn to design with. 
and that's, that's nice. alpaca and wool and like super wash so that was very kind of him and i still have a couple designs that i want to to put out <laughs> put out with his yarn so right. i hope i have the time to write them all down <laughs> One one design at the time, you know, it's like I like to say, tell everybody yes. when people start complaining how like they don't, they overwhelm with this certain project, I always say, listen, just take a breather and just knitting, just one That's stitch true. at the time, you know, so you do the same with design, one design at the time. Yeah, and you take your time. It. Yeah. We have to take our time. <laughs> Talk a little especially, bit about like, so you have, um, you, you have like a lot of designs culturally based on Philippines, right? Tell us a yeah. little bit about, like, I know that la the show that you just showed, uh, tell a little bit, like, how you think of, like, what influences you, how you decide on the design, like, cultural, okay. uh, influence-wise. Um, I, I did say that I was, I was, like, singing since I was very young, right? And performance. So when you're a performer in, in my part of the woods, um, they always emphasize the need for you to represent your culture and your heritage. Right. And I think from a very young age, I've been, um, that, that value has been, has been like prevalent throughout my life. Because um, when I was growing up as well, um, my grandma would, would, I was, I always accompanied my grandma to social events, to like big cultural feasts and traditional weddings and like, funerals and funeral rites. So growing up, those were normal for me. Right. And um, when I went to college, because I went to college in the capital of the country in Manila, which is like very, it's, it's very far from, from Baguio. And I realized that not everybody is the same. I mean, the Philippines is a very diverse group of, of it's a diverse group of people, the Filipinos. We have like we have almost two hundred native uh, two hundred native languages wow. in the Philippines, all with their cultural values and all. And I'm just one. I represent one of them, right. and that's very big for me. So, drawing from my culture, I feel I feel very proud to share my heritage to the world through knitting and fiber art. Um, with motifs, is what I is what I what I'm drawn to, weaving motifs or tattoo icons or folklore. I've always loved folklore and mythology. It's because it's all so different. The mythology in, in the Northern Philippines is not the same like 200 miles from here. It's not the same. <laughs> and then you go further, further south, it's all different stories. So all of those, all of those influenced me. It, it's very fascinating to me to find find these stories and relate them. Do you relate write them those to stories somehow. in your patterns? Like when you write a pattern, do you put a little explanation of like what's behind it? A little cultural. I do. Yeah, I do. Um, especially this one. This is one of my favorites. Actually, this is this is my tawid hat. Tawid means inheritance. And in my pattern description, I was talking about how, because this is the, the tiktiko motif, which is like the rice pattern. It, yes. represent, it, rep, it, it represents rice. And rice is a very big thing in my culture. Um, people people in, 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 in the ancient peoples would divide their year through the cycle of the rice. Oh, interesting. So, so yeah, there was, there was a... Um, there were rituals that that um, that that began the the rice cycle, and then in the middle, and then during harvest time, and they would frame their their year throughout that. They would say, "Oh, my name is so and so, and I was born when the harvest when during the rice harvest, or I was I was born during when when the rice was growing." So it was that important. It was a time marker, and. The cultural practices surrounding rice is very important. It's, been, it's being passed down right now, but there is no one to receive them because people are becoming more modern. And I don't know, uh, there's ancient, ancient, these ancient values are, I don't know, very, I find them very fascinating. And I've designed this hat 
because I believe that rice and all that it represents is our inheritance. Right. The rituals and all the indigenous knowledge related to it. It is an inheritance. Right. Well, well I'm it. glad you are teaching that even if you like educate a few people, you know, around the world, it's like it's still your impact on helping yeah. the heritage stay, you know. Um, but yeah, with knitting, with knitting and designing, I just design what I like. I don't really... <laughs> <laughs> and what what really means to me the thing with the thing with my designs it, it's all very personal to me right and but that's that's what people probably are attracted to because it's like it looks very different and it looks like very unique and you can s tell the you know it's like i feel like a lot of times and that's actually my next question to you when, when people design sometimes like i feel like designers under pressure to just put something on the market that will sell just because it's also business. How do you look at that side? Like, do you, when you think of a design, do you try to think like what would be popular, what would sell, or do you just go by what something means to you? I've been, I've been tempted to, to do that, to, to put out a pattern just so I can put out a pattern. But when I put, I, re I remove the pressure of making money from my knitting. I have, I have to because um, otherwise I couldn't be creative. Right. It's the same way what I did with my music. I, um, w w in my music career, I see a lot of parallels in my knitting career. The moment I let go of like, that monetary value, placing and just doing a good job of it and just sharing my talent and doing, giving back. And then eventually... The money came right <laughs> so it's not it's not about it's not about doing your best to make money it's doing your best because you want to do your best and then the money comes after is my philosophy right so but even with my knitting even with my knitting as long as i keep doing it and as long as i keep improving with every pattern i i believe that it could be a business right, right now it's not right now it's not really very lucrative lucrative but Eventually, I hope it, it goes to that point. I hope I don't run out of steam with knitting and that will come years later. No, we're gonna be I hope on it never case. comes. We're going to be on yeah. this case asking for more designs. So. I hope so. I hope so. I'm very happy when people post, about, uh, people post that uh, when, they, when they make one of my designs. It makes me very happy. Right. Um, well, if you ever need a tester, I'm around so you can... Oh yeah, I always need <laughs> a tester. I, I love to test food. Um, tell me a little bit about, uh, is there like any other hidden talents or hobbies that we don't know that like any other passions besides the music and the knitting? Hmm, not really. <laughs> um, right now, all of my, all of my, all of the things I do are surround, uh, are, um, pertaining to my music and pertaining to my to my knitting. Is that's there that's like, where my world revolves around now. Is there a place where people can hear your music? Um, right now, it's it's like one or two videos on YouTube. So I, I don't really put out a lot of music because mainly I teach and I conduct is what I do a lot of the times. I have a few videos out which are me singing and then me and my duet partner singing and it's it's just like I'd nothing serious actually if you, you want to dm me i'd love to see that I, I can i can send you some stuff <laughs> yeah um do you ever talk when you like in zoom meeting because uh both keenan and michael green were like mentioning your name like left and right they all love you, do you i do love them <laughs> Do you ever talk about like putting a Zoom band together with Keenan or something? We actually go on Zoom quite regularly. Zoom, um, Keenan and Michael, we we, right. we 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 talk like quite regularly actually, <laughs> um, uh, and with a few other people like Nicole Tobias and and Andy Sampson and Chester. There's um, yeah, it's it's quite a community that 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 came out of this pandemic. And we're all over. They're all they're all in the states. I'm in the Philippines, but 
but well, it's I've my never, time there and I'm in my Have you ever thought <laughs> about making Keenan play his cello and you singing? We were talking about we were talking about doing like box double concerto because I I started practicing the violin again. <laughs> I'm very rusty, but yeah, maybe we can get to a point where we can do a duet with Keenan with a box uh, double violin. Would love to see that. <laughs> yeah, I'm excited too. I mean, it, I haven't touched the violin in ages, so okay. my fingers are so stiff. What are you working on right now? Like, what's your next? Unless it's a secret, like, what's next no, thing that's like coming secret. out? Um, I'm working on a, a like a pair of cowls. So I have a north and south cowl. This cowl, I'm working on the pattern right now. This is um, this is a cowl that's representing the northern part of the Philippines, but the lowlands this time. I'm from the, um, it's like, it's inspired by their blankets and their weaving style. So, Beautiful. and the, and the motif is like um, about, it's a compass motif or the crab motif. So it's about being in place, being at the right, um, at the right, um, at the right place at the right time. So right. it's about that. And it has a counterpart in the Southern part of the Philippines, which is, which I'm actually working on like, Right now, this one. Oh, that's beautiful. Yeah. The London Needles. And it's, it has like the same motif, but it, it's a different, it's a different kind of, it has a different story to it. And this one came from their mats and their, um, their, their woven mats. Right. And so, when yeah. is that coming out? Do you have an estimate? I have no clue. <laughs> I don't know yet. I'm trying to, um, I'm, I'm rushing to put out the, the testing call for this one, probably this month. Right. And yeah, for both of them, I'm trying to, but this is almost done. And I'm trying to finish this so that I can put out the call together so that the story is complete, so that it's a North and South representation. Right. And yeah. Well, when you post the call, post it, and Nita's gonna need as well, so, because... Oh, you, you'll you know it. Yeah, I'll post it there. I love that group. <laughs> you know, it's like, I was talking to David yesterday about it, and I said, I just, like, we need to wake up the whole group. Like, I feel like I want to post every day. I want everybody to post. And he's like, girl, people are posting. Like, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> I, I'm just like, I love the energy of that group. I love when people... That's like, true. Yeah. Um, well, thank you so very much for joining me. And it was like lovely to get to know you better. And, you know, I hope we'll yeah. stay in touch and continue to talk. Of course. Yeah. Thank you for having me, Irina. That was great. I'm yeah. actually quite nervous still. I can still feel my heart. But no, yeah, you're, you're just... a great interviewer. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. It was a pleasure.